The 1939 American Care Corps expedition to K2 has been described as one of the worst tragedies in climbing history. It certainly is one of the most controversial expeditions to date, with K2 being notorious as one of the hardest 8,000 meter peaks to summit. There are many technical aspects of the climb and the location of the mountain is perfect for storms to accumulate around it. But what if you were only 800 feet from the summit and without your knowledge, men below began removing the supplies and camps below you? leaving you to fend for yourself on the descent. Well, that's exactly what happened to Fritz Wiesner, Pasong Dawi Lama, and Deadly Wolf. This is their story. Our story actually begins in 1937, when the British colonial authorities approved a plan to reach the summit in 1938 and 1939. The 1938 expedition was key in expanding their knowledge and would lay the groundwork for all future ventures going forward. It would be one of the first times British and American climbers had traveled to K2. They were able to figure out what the best route to take up the mountain was, which would later become known as the Abruzzi Spur Route. They would identify key areas where supplies and tents could be established, and they would also learn where some of the more technical climbs were located to better prepare themselves. It paved the way for the 1939 expedition, which could not have taken place without this knowledge. Fritz Wiesner was a German rock climber who had settled in America and had been living there for over 10 years. In that time, he would gain his citizenship as well as complete some of the first ascents of multiple mountains in the Alps. Wiesner was one of the only individuals at the time that had attempted a climb on Nanga Parbat, marking him as a man who had actual experience on an 8000er in the country before 1938. So he was an obvious choice to lead the 1939 expedition. Unfortunately, America was still recovering from the Great Depression, so there was not a lot of funding to go around, and those that did have the money typically were not experienced mountaineers, so they had to look outside of the mountaineering community to raise the funds. Just by a random chance, Wiesner had been invited to Dudley Wolf's party in 1938. Now Wolf had inherited most of his wealth in the range of 700 to 800 million US dollars today. As soon as the two met, they began sharing stories about their youth and how they enjoyed the outdoors. Dudley became fascinated in hearing about Wiesner's climbs, and as soon as he told him about K2, he was hooked. Despite his inexperience, he was eager to join and fund the entire expedition. So in December of 1938, Dudley boarded the Georgic and sailed to Austria. He would spend a few months with his divorced wife before setting out to England, where he met Wiesner in March 1939. Since England had the best mountaineering supply in the world at the time, the pair would load up on climbing equipment. They would meet four other climbers that would be joining them for the expedition, and all six would set off by ship together. The ship landed on April 10th in Bombay, India, and the team traveled the rest of the way by train to Sringar. As they traveled, drama began to form between Wiesner and another climber named Durrance. As Wiesner felt that Durrance would not listen or respect some of his decisions, but there was no turning back now, so the two just had to make do. By the end of April 9th, Sherpas had joined the team in Sringar, and once they were all together, they began their month-long hike to K2. Porters had been pre-selected and ended up carrying most of the gear to base camp. The team was very enthusiastic along the hike as spirits were high, and by the end of May they had made it to the mountain. Unfortunately, a day after base camp was established, Canmer, one of the original six men, and probably the second best climber out of the group behind Wiesner, got very sick and was close to death. Fortunately, he would recover, but this would mark the end of his participation. Wiesner would be the one leading the climb, and the healthy men would follow him up the mountain. While at base camp, he also served as the organizational leader, but once the real work started, this was harder for him to do, especially the higher up they went. Since Canmer was too sick to do much, Wiesner appointed a man named Cromwell to manage the details from below. It was determined that due to his responsibilities, Cromwell would go no further than the location of Camp 4. Durrance forgot his climbing boots, so he was forced to wait until supplies from porters came in, which did not help his already damaged relationship with Wiesner. The first major task that the men faced was establishing Camp 4. Now remember, all of the camp locations had been pre-planned, so the men had an advantage that the previous expedition did not. The climb began on June 8th, but the progress was slow due to the large amount of gear they had to haul up, and the fact that Cromwell was not taking charge but by June 19th, they had managed to reach their designated campsite. 
During this climb, Wolf quickly became Wiesner's favorite, partly because he was funding the majority of the expedition, but also because Wolf was a hard worker that never complained. Although his inexperience did prove to be a safety hazard as the other climbers had to keep a close eye on him, this caused frustration from those that had to support him, as it felt like they were just babysitting the money. Two days after Camp 4 was set up, a severe storm settled on the mountain, causing temperatures to drop to negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 19 degrees Celsius. Lower on the mountain, the wind reached gusts of 80 miles an hour, as everyone was forced to take shelter. The storm would last for eight days, and on July 29th, it suddenly stopped. A much needed reprieve as the men had begun to become discouraged, but during the storm, Cromwell had been injured in a fall, and another man, apart from the original six, named Sheldon, developed frostbite on his toes. Both men were excluded in their work as they wouldn't be very helpful to the team for about two weeks. At this time, Duras finally received his climbing boots, so the men tasked a Sherpa to carry a note up to Wiesner. On July 1st, Wiesner and Wolf would continue the climb to set up Camp 5 at 6,705 meters. It was at this location that the Sherpa handed Wiesner the note about Durance, but there seemed to be a misunderstanding based on his reply. You see, Wiesner had thought Durance received his boots on June 21st, when he actually received them on June 28th. With that in mind, the leader told Durrance that he was very disappointed in him, which was taken as an attack on his character. But what Wiesner did not know was that the men below really took a liking to Durrance, because he had been contributing the most when it came to carrying supplies and the morale at base camp. The note caused an instant rift, with most members in the expedition against Wiesner. Wolf was beginning to be the only ally that the expedition leader really had. A three-day storm had prevented the team from going any further, but once it had passed, Wiesner, along with a few Sherpas, climbed to Camp 6. The very next day, they traversed the Black Pyramid, a section of jagged rocks to reach the top of the Abruzzi Ridge and establish Camp 7 at 7,529 meters. Wolf had remained at Camp 5, awaiting orders, and since no supplies had been brought up the mountain, Wiesner would descend back down to Camp 2 to inform the team of their progress. Durrance, Cromwell, a man named Trench, and six Sherpas were all excited to learn about what Wiesner had accomplished and were eager to see it for themselves. Following the trail that had been laid out, all the men at Camp 2 ascended to Camp 5 without issues, but the climb was taxing and the men were exhausted by the time that they had reunited with Wolf. Unfortunately, Wolf had started to develop frostbite on his toes, and Durrance advised him to descend the mountain. However, Wiesner was against this, and convinced Wolf to continue, citing that Durrance was just jealous an inexperienced climber had made it this far. All the men climbed together to Camp 6, but Wolf was struggling, and greatly relied on those around him for assistance. On July 13th, they would all continue to Camp 7, but once they made it, Durrance was too exhausted to continue and he would end up descending back to Camp 4, along with four other Sherpas. While the men were climbing, two Sherpas went ahead and set up Camp 8 in preparation. So after reaching Camp 7, Wiesner, Wolf, and three Sherpas continued upwards to join them. Once they reached Camp 8, another brutal storm settled on the mountain, and would last eight days. The men's supplies were severely stretched at this point, and the Sherpas began to worry about having enough left to reach the summit. However, Wiesner and Wolf almost had a contagious joy about them, as they were overly excited to have reached this point. Once the storm had passed, two Sherpas were sent down to let the other men know that supplies were needed, and to begin ferrying what they could up the mountain. Once the Sherpas walked into Camp 4, they were greeted by Durrance, who was now suffering from the early stages of hypoxia and cerebral edema. Although he still was strong enough to descend to Camp 2 with the help from the Sherpas. But once they reached camp, Durrance was horrified with what he saw. The entire place was a mess, and the men had no idea what they were doing. Cromwell and Trench were completely checked out of the expedition and had no desire to do anything more. This only damaged the relationship between Wiesner and the men more as they began to think that he had abandoned them, despite still being on the mountain. While the organizational disaster occurred below, Wiesner and Wolf were sitting at Camp 8 preparing for a summit bid. They believed supplies would begin ferrying up towards them, but down below there had been a huge mistake overlooked. Many of the Sherpas did not speak English, so when they were given instructions, half the time they did not understand, and this proved to be disastrous for those still in high altitude. 
I also want to note that by this time, Wolf had been above 6,000 meters and higher for over 26 days. The risk of staying at high altitudes for an extended period of time was not known as well as it is today. In fact, his extended stay on the mountain is unheard of in recent times. An aspect that makes K2 much harder to climb a mountain such as Everest is that the technicality of the route becomes increasingly more difficult the higher up you go. Simply put, Wolf did not have the experience to continue, nor did he have the strength anymore. So it was decided that he would remain at Camp 8 while Wiesner and fellow Sherpa attempted the summit. And on the morning of July 17th, the pair made some progress traversing difficult areas of K2 and would eventually settle in for the night as they created Camp 9 around 7,900 meters. The summit was only 670 meters away, and on July 19th, they would set out again. But this time, Wiesner and his Sherpa, Pasong Lama, were faced with a difficult challenge. They had seen the infamous bottleneck from a distance and decided to go away from it, not knowing that while it is intimidating, it is truly the easier route. Their other option would be to traverse a very technical rock climb to the left of the bottleneck. This route is hardly ever taken on K2, even with the most experienced climbers. They spent over 9 hours trying to traverse the rocks, until eventually Pasong Lama could go no further. Surprisingly, they managed to reach 8,370 meters, only being a mere 240 meters away from the summit. It is ironic, because they just spent their entire day traveling the more difficult path, only to stop when the rest of the way was actually very simple. Nevertheless, they descended back to Camp 9, but along the way, Pasong lost his crampons, a crucial device used to walk on snow and ice. The following day, July 21st, the pair attempted to climb again, this time through the bottleneck. But they did not make much progress and quickly abandoned the attempt, as Pasong Lama could not climb without his crampons. While all this was going on, there were four Sherpas that were tasked with carrying supplies up to the various camps. Although there was some misunderstanding between the Sherpas and the American men, which caused nothing to get done. It was not until July 20th that the Sherpas would climb up to Camp 7 to gather information on Wiesner, Wolf, and Pasong Lama. However, they never reached Camp 8, where Wolf was located. Instead, they shouted from Camp 7 and waited for a response, but there would be none as Wiesner was still at Camp 9 while Wolf rested at Camp 8, so the Sherpas began to assume that the others had already perished on the peak. There were signs of an avalanche, but this would be a completely wrong assumption. With only three days left in the expedition, the four Sherpas decided to return to base camp, but not before stripping Camp 7, 6, and 5 as they descended, thinking that they were helping the men below. While this was occurring, Durrance and a few Sherpas were moving supplies down from the lower camps back to base camp. The porters were expected to arrive on July 23rd, and they wanted to be prepared. The men at base camp expected Wiesner, Wolf, and five Sherpas to be returning, but only four Sherpas walked into camp that day. Wiesner had not been heard from since July 14th, and the team assumed the worst. Durans surprisingly showed great concern and wanted to wait and confirm Wiesner's whereabouts, but the Sherpas that had climbed up to Camp 7 convinced him that they were no longer alive. Wiesner and Pasong Lama would descend on July 22nd with the expectation that they would be resupplying before another summit attempt, but after reaching Camp 8, they were horrified with what they found. Wolf had been alone this entire time, and there had been no resupply of the camp. All three men no longer had any matches, which meant that they could not cook food or melt ice, and this caused all of them to descend to Camp 7 together. But along the way, Wolf almost fell to his death due to exhaustion, losing his sleeping bag in the process. The only reason that he was alive is due to a fixed rope attached to Pasong Lama. However, their troubles did not stop there. Once the men reached Camp 7, they realized that no help would be coming. The campsite was practically non-existent, as the tent was buried under snow, and most of the supplies were gone. Luckily, there was a stove with fuel that ended up saving all of their lives that night. Wolf's condition was so dire that he would not be able to descend further without additional help. So the next day, Wiesner and Pasong left Wolf at Camp 7, descending K2. Camp after camp, they made their way down the mountain, finding very little food or shelter along the way, almost like ghosts walking in the night until eventually they made it back on July 24th. Pasong was barely able to walk 
and was in worse condition than Wiesner, who was understandably furious at all the men, accusing them of abandoning him on the mountain. It was a disastrous scene as Cromwell took offense, and feeling ashamed began accusing Wiesner of abandoning Wolf. Durrance recognized that this was going nowhere, and tried to calm everyone down as they needed to form a plan for Wolf quickly. Base camp had already been packed up in preparation for the porters, and Cromwell was assisting them in leading the equipment back to Askol, while Durrance, along with three Sherpas, would ascend K2. It took two days for them to reach Camp 4, but once they arrived, Durrance and a fellow Sherpa were too exhausted to continue, and therefore the other two Sherpas, named Pasong Qatar and Fisno, climbed up to Camp 6 together. The next day, two more Sherpas named Pasong Kikulumo and Sering Norbu would make quick work of the mountain and reach Camp 6 in just under a day, a feat that would not be repeated for decades. On July 29th, Kikulu, Katar, and Fisno found Wolf alive at Camp 7, completely apathetic and in terrible condition. He was covered in his own urine and feces, with no food or water left. Wolf refused to move and was adamant about staying for the night, telling the Sherpas that he would be ready tomorrow. Not knowing what to do, the Sherpas descended back to Camp 6, where Norbu was waiting. I want to note that by this time, Wolf had spent 38 days above 6,700 meters and 16 days above 7,000 meters. The effects that this had on his brain is hard to say, but we now know that humans are not suited for extended stays at such high altitudes. Disaster would strike the next day as a storm settled on the mountain and would last two days. On July 31st, Kakulu, Katar, and Fisno would set off Camp 7 to rescue Wolf. None of these men were ever seen alive again. After the Sherpas failed to come down that night, Norbu returned to base camp to deliver the news. Wiesner was quick to dismiss his claims, and even attempted to start another rescue attempt, but it never really gained any traction, so it's not worth digging into. In 1995, all three Sherpa remains were found on the Godwin-Austin Glacier, and in 2002, Wolf's remains, along with his tent, were found on the same glacier, but at an entirely different location. This would mean that the Sherpas were not with Wolf at the time of their deaths, so it's safe to assume that they had died either trying to reach Wolf or descending without him. Either way, the Savage Mountain once again reminds us of the brutality of nature. Critics of Wiesner would continue well into the 1950s until a book was released detailing the expedition more closely. There had been mixed opinions in the mountaineering community as to who deserved the blame for the four deaths, continuing even today. I don't believe it matters who is right or wrong. I just think that Wolf was not ready to take on the Savage Mountain, a mistake that he and the others paid the ultimate price for.